we keep finding ways that we're helping partners, finding either you know balance in their life or focus or purpose. Practices that are gonna help improve your project management skills or your finances. We're here to talk about setting long-term goals and then how to achieve them. Increasing your quality, therefore becoming the best place in town to work. Welcome to Academy Live. Welcome back to Academy Live. Bessie's off today, uh, hopefully enjoying yourself. So today we're going to be talking about customer success. So we have a very special guest today. Craig Felton is going to be on. We're excited to talk to him. Uh, and, you know, this is really an, an important talk and a great guest. So we're going to jump right into it. But first, let's kick off with the sales pitch. Today's topic of customer success is a good one. Not just satisfaction, but success. Being successful as a player, coach, or front office executive in baseball is crucial. Having a winning team is good, but making the playoffs, winning a championship, that's the goal. It takes the entire team from players on the field to the managers to the front office to put it all together. If a team, for some reason, doesn't reach that goal, changes need to be made by ownership to make that happen. In our IT services business, in order to achieve success, we must ensure the success of our prospect, of the buyer. One of the goals of results selling framework is to align how we sell to the way the buyer and prospects and our clients want to buy. Buyers typically go through three stages during their decision process, articulating needs, evaluating their options, and then how's that going to mitigate their risk. So think about the last major purchase decision you made, whether that was buying a house or buying a car, and all the things you did before you even reached out to a realtor or went to the car dealership. The way of buying today is different. So that's what you got to do to ensure that buyer success. So let's touch all the bases ensuring that our buyers do receive the success that they want. One, selling is not about your sales pitch or how unique your selling proposition is. It's about understanding who you're talking to and asking questions to get to know them better and to build trust with them. Two, ensuring the buyer or the prospect is getting the results they want. How do you do that? Ask them what results they want to get. What are the outcomes they're trying to achieve? Three, the key to having buyer success is asking questions to find out what they need at this moment in time in their business. And then out of those things that they need, which one do they want the most? Then four, Articulating your value and differentiation on how you've helped other companies solve that similar problem or problems. So to ensure that your buyer, your prospect is successful, remember this one piece of advice. Prospects are willing to be led, but only if you can take them to a place they can't get there on their own. So put yourself in the buyer's shoes, understand and solve their problems, and that's how you win championships in sales. Awesome, Keith. Thank you. Keep those coming. Those things are awesome. And if you want to learn more about solution selling, check out the results selling framework at uh, academy.pax8.com. There's uh, seven free on demand, watch them whenever you want courses out there, mostly featuring Keith. So um, check those out. I wanted to bring Craig Fulton on. When I heard we were doing um, a show about customer success, I the 
there's only one person that came to mind, and it's my buddy Craig Fulton. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, the book that he turned me on to here in a few minutes. But uh, Craig, uh, tell us about yourself. Bring up, bring some of your humble yeah. brag. All right. Thanks, Rick. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, honored, really. Um, yeah. So those that may not know me, yeah, I'm from a small town in Ohio. And I always think it's important to say that I was raised by a librarian and an auto line worker because I got the best of the technical side and the customer service side. Um, spent some time in the military, worked at a big enterprise in tech. Then I joined an MSP, a little one in Tampa called ConnectWise. And um, after a couple of years at that MSP, uh, you know, I, I think everybody knows the founder. If you're not, Arnie Bellini taps me on the shoulder and says, you know, I see the way you use the system. Uh, I'd love to have you on our team and help, you know, teach others how to use the PSA and become managed service providers. And that's when I met Rex. And then, uh, you know, I had quite a journey in the company. I, I was pretty sure I was going to be a tech for the rest of my life. Like, let's just fix broken computers and, <laughs> and uh, play with technology. Um, next thing I know, I'm implementing the software, and then I became the chief product officer at the company. And, and during that time, I found a book called Customer Success, and I, and I got pretty obsessed with understanding what it takes to get people to you know, use more of a product, uh, have a willingness to buy more and renew. And um, when the company went through some changes, and it came time to appoint the first chief customer officer, they all pointed to me and said, well, he talks about customer success all the time. Um, so I spent the last four years at ConnectWise as chief customer um, officer and a great guy, uh, VP, or no, I think he's, uh, yeah, he's the VP of customer success, Nathan Fullington. We spent some time building out that function in the company, following that book to a T. Um, I've since uh, closed that chapter in my life and, I thought the next best thing I can do is work with MSPs to ensure they're getting the most value out of their business when it comes time for that next stage, which is an exit, a sale, M&A. And that's what I'm doing now with Evergreen. And here I am with my buddy Rex and, and Chris <laughs> from user groups, both of these guys. Good to see you. Glad to have you here. Yeah, Craig, Craig you were running community um, for a long time. Like you're Mr. IT Nation and... Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I think one of the coolest things is um, within ConnectWise, I, at least my outsider's perception was that you were probably the strongest like voice of the partner in the room. Um, yeah, so much so that I actually have the tattoo of the IT Nation right here. I got the, <laughs> um, the community was life-changing for me. I, I accredit everything I have and all of my success to the community and meeting people like you and the MSP owners out there and service managers and financial controllers and everything we've learned. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great journey. You're always very active in connecting with the partners and the people and really getting to know them and their businesses. And I think that had a lot yeah. of impact on a lot of partners and the impact on, on ConnectWise and your business as well. Yeah, Craig, gonna... well, go ahead if i could I, I just want to yeah i want to give a shout out because you know it is uh women's history month and i i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for two great women in my life number one my mother um going to the library after school and watching how they provide service there and treat customers and you know library was google <laughs> before google <laughs> you had a question you'd come in and ask the librarian and they would research it for you um and then Kathy Smith, at, uh, she was with ConnectWise. Um, you know, I learned a lot of great customer service techniques from her and spending time in the community. So uh, two, two great influences in my life. Perfect. Great, great shout out. Thank you, Craig. I didn't have now the privilege of meeting your mom, but uh, Kathy, I think, is an impactful on everybody in the community. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so Craig, we do a thing on the show where we have a quote. And you presented a, one of your favorite quotes. I'd like to bring that up now and have you read it okay. and tell us why that's relevant to you. Yeah, have the courage to be yourself. Uh, this is something I've learned from two great mentors, again, Kathy Smith and Arnie Bellini. Um, you know, for the longest part of my life, I just thought, I got to do what everybody thinks I should be doing. And uh, it's not a happy place to be. And, you know, and, and they saw some talent in me that, 
hey, just get outside your comfort zone and talk to people and just be yourself and and uh, you'll enjoy doing this a lot more. And um, I think that's what's made me the character that people know. Like, I think when people see me, they're like, oh, that guy's crazy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, maybe I am. Uh, but um, I think it just comes from the fact that when I have an idea, I just act on it and like myself. And, and at the end of the day, I can sleep. And um, I, I encourage anyone to, right? Uh, you, you can only find happiness in yourself. So that quote truly resonates with me. I think, uh, I think the way it comes out for most, uh, for me is around Christmas time when we get to start seeing Dingleberry and, and the yeah. Florida man. What is that yeah. all about? Yeah. Uh, look, I'm a big vanilla ice fan <laughs> and he told me smiles are <laughs> and, and, um, when 2020 hit, not a lot of people were smiling. And towards the end of the year, it was, I mean, it was really taking a toll on me not being able to crack jokes and smile. And uh, I thought, you know what? You got this elf on the shelf thing that you do with the kids. I'm going to do a real live uh, full-size version. So I bought a elf, elf costume. You know, Barry, uh, I felt, you know, every kid's got their, you know, oh, that's, you know, Barry seems to be the last word in the name. I thought that'd be a good one. Um <laughs> And uh, I started every day, I would have a, another pose in that costume and it progressively got worse every day. And then the news actually <laughs> saw it on Facebook. And, and I said, I'll do this story on two conditions. One, you have to say the elf's name. Two, I have to be referred to as Florida man. So I'm an honorary Florida man. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for the behavior of a lot of my colleagues in our community, but um, I'm, I'm a little more on the more positive side of the Florida man. <laughs> I, I love that so yeah. much. And uh, honestly, Craig, it's like, that's just a natural thing. Like it, it's so out there, but it is just so you. And I absolutely love that. And like you said, the positive spin was just, to me, that was very touching. Um, so, yeah. but I, I want to poke a little, because you and Rex have a lot of history. So, I know I've heard a couple stories, but there seems to be one that, you know, about a, a, a mic left on and maybe some things said where you thought the mic, I mean, why don't I let you uh, guys, I want to hear both of you tell a little bit about this story. Yeah. Well, Rex, I wasn't sure if he was going to talk about the Ninja one, but yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the user group in Seattle, it was one of our, it was our first chapter in our friendship, right? We met at the user groups there and you saved my butt big time, man. Uh, I was a little late, actually. <laughs> yeah, so uh, those tuned in, you know, you have those embarrassing mic moments where people accidentally leave them on and go to the bathroom. I did something much worse than that. Um, you know, I was presenting some software and a feature, and and uh, Matt Dreyfout of Scout Technology Guides in Vancouver, he decided to ask me to demonstrate it live, knowing that the feature wasn't going to work. And I walked through the feature, and it failed, and everybody – you know, cracked up on me and I um, left my mic on. I remember and the crowd was really being, really... the crowd was being really, really rough on you. Yeah, like unfairly okay. so, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I walked out of the room and I said, oh, this mother effer just called me out. And then everybody heard me and <laughs> the, the door bus I'm, I'm opened and like it's Rex, the... turn your mic off. I'm by sitting <laughs> by the back row and I busted out the back door. Craig, mic's on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I think everyone was mad at you. You should have let him keep going. That was great. So, I, I so luckily so. for me, yeah, I was I was able to. They they laughed it off. So um, good good save and and thanks Rex. You you saved my career. It, who knows where that was going to go? <laughs> Thank you. I think it was Andrea Kaby you were talking to, who is now Andrea Barrow. I actually. It was David Bellini. I remember the moment very vividly because oh. he was sitting next to the window and I just erupted how upset I was. So, yeah. <laughs> well, right on. Uh, I th what do you say we start talking about customer success? All right. Um, you know, I didn't, I don't know that I really um, totally understood what customer success was. Um, I thought I knew what it was. I thought it was, you know, just the way you interact with your customers and, and this and that. But, you know, I'm a process guy. I'm a procedure guy. 
And I, I just felt like there had to be a little bit more. And I remember asking Craig a little bit, you know, like, you, you know, I, I see you got this customer success title now at ConnectWise, you know, like, where's all that coming from? And he, you know, just, I remember we were in his office and he turns around and he grabs this book and he pulls it out and he holds it up in my face and he's all, it's right here. Um, so I don't know, Craig, what, yeah. what, what can you tell us to introduce this book? Yeah. Um, again, I want to give a shout out to Nathan Fullington at ConnectWise. He, you know, that was a product officer. He came to me. He was a, he was a product manager and he said, I'm, I'm concerned about our renewal rates and our retention. And I'm like, yeah, what's that? <laughs> And he gave me the book and I read it. And and like you, I was like, wait, I thought customer success was just providing support, keeping people happy, um, measuring their NPS. And it's a lot more, right? It's about retention. And there's two types of retention, net retention, gross retention. But at the end of the day, what you want to do with customer success is make sure your customers are engaged, right? And they become raving fans um, and they'll renew and they'll stick around with you. Um, what was interesting about ConnectWise at that time is we were just naturally doing this. We didn't know there was a label for it. Um, without needing to do it, we created the university. We did user groups. We had our community. Um, we were proactively already doing these things. Um, so it made it a real easy segue into just building that function in the company. But that book followed it to the T. Uh, it's a great book for anybody looking because it – it's, it's not account management, it's not customer support, it is its own completely separate thing and, and I'm excited to be talking about it. Well, I'd like if to get bring in. that graf graphic back real quick, because yeah. like whenever somebody tells asks me about it, I say, oh, it's got a really um, short title, easy to remember, but customer success, yeah. how innovative companies are reducing churn and growing recurring revenue. It's like, wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like uh, to. Can I say something? Funny? Oh, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, please. Um, so I, we've actually met these people that wrote this book. Uh, when we were building this out, we engaged with um, I think Lincoln Murphy. He's he's a character. He's like a Craig Fulton. He um he does that wrestling uh down in Mexico with the masks. He, the luchador <laughs> is huh? coming. I never See, saw that coming. I think we need to we need to add that to our theme for a show, Rex. We'll have to talk to Jen at some time. But yeah, what, Craig, what I wanted to get into is you said you you followed this very successful. This was almost like a a recipe book or something, a guide for your company to yeah. to be successful. So I'd love to have you kind of introduce the concept of this, the ten laws, and let's talk a little right. bit about some of the laws because i reviewing this material before that some of it was kind of counterintuitive to me and like rex said yeah. you know it's something yeah that's just what this is it sounds simple but let's get into it a little right. bit so introduce the 10 laws or just the concept if you wouldn't mind please yeah yeah the book's got a lot of concepts in it and and uh, listen anybody tuned in here it's not it's it's, it's not an easy read <laughs> um Divide it up in segments. I'm not a big reader either, uh, but this is one I've read uh, cover to cover. And there's a 10 laws that get exposed in there. Um, and yeah, we should jump into those because these, these should be key to anybody building a customer success function. And oh, this has now become commonplace in a SaaS business. It's plus fees. There's a lot of people out there starting to build that. Uh, Evergreen, we recently did position and all uh, you know, Chris Barnes there, growing customer success team, um, B-Tech, uh, Ben Johnson, and like growing a customer success team. MSPs are doing this, um, and, they're, and people are starting to dial in what it takes. And, and I think the 10 laws, Chris, great place to, to talk this through. Then let's, let's bring them up and let's just kind of go over them one at a time, if you don't mind. I mean, uh, you know, when you look at these, like you said, they're just the ten. And to me, it's a great structure, right? Like it's a great way of kind of breaking these up and just kind of attaching, you know, one at a time. And some of these sound really obvious. Some of them don't. Right. I'd love to, you know. But let's just start with sell to the right customer. So Craig and Rex, I'd love to have you oh, chime boy. in and kind of talk about what that means. Yeah. You start, Rex. I've been talking a lot. 
I was going to say Craig's a guest. We should let him go first, but um, I'll start this one. Um, yeah. You know, at uh, at sea level, people don't always understand this. We one of the reasons we had the high net promoter score was we put a, like a little barrier in the selling process because we found if we pushed it all to do something, then they would sign up, but then they wouldn't come to the meetings, they wouldn't do the homework, and they really wouldn't get the experience that we were promising. But if we put a little bit of a barrier in the selling process and waited for them to contact us back, we found that those that contacted us back, they showed up. They, they showed up to the meetings, they did the homework, they had the outcomes, and ultimately they became our net promoters. And that's why we, we had this 95 net promoter score. Um, it, and I really attribute it to, we were very choosing of who were the right customers for us. I don't know. All right. What do you yeah, think, Craig? Um, yeah. And I, and I want to correct myself real quick because I'm, I, I hate getting names wrong. It was, it's Priscilla Bernardis. I said Priscilla Barnes and I had to check myself. Um, agree with you. Um, and look, rule number one, selling the right customer. I see so many MSPs get this wrong and, and I get it. You're getting your business started. You got to get revenue coming in the door. You start bringing on a lot of customers, um, if whatever you can get. And, and that might be a good way to start, but as you mature, churn is a good thing, right? You got to start weeding out the customers that aren't good for your business. Those that are taking too much time and, and, uh, from support, those that are, you know, not adhering to your standards, maybe in cybersecurity, you know, and, and so when you think about this, selling the right customer, you're like, wait a minute, that that sounds like it's something outside of customer success that's more in sales. Yeah, this is a whole company wide thing. Um, you've got you've got to work with your sales team to identify what's the type of customer we go after, right? I, I talk to a lot of MSBs now to roll them in and I mean, I'm truly grateful I get to hear so many details and these mature MSPs that are doing really well bringing high EBITDA percentages are telling me, yeah, I don't sell to anybody that has less than 50 customers. I won't sell to anyone that won't adopt the, the security tech stack I have. Um, you know, there's a lot of alignment there. If, if you don't figure out what your customer profile is, and it doesn't have to be a vertical market, it could just be a profile that you determine is yours, you're going to really struggle to get customer success right because you got to measure them along the way. And so if there's too much variation there or you got bad customers, it, it's just going to make this much more challenging. Great stuff. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I found is um, there's this magic moment when you feel like you got to hire somebody, but you don't not feel like you got the revenue to do it, but you know you need to hire somebody that maybe the best option, and, and, and I'm going to say this um, figuratively, maybe the best option is to fire a client, right? And what I don't mean yeah. like fire them. I mean, now, now you've got the guts to go talk to them about why they need to pay appropriately. And hopefully yeah. by paying appropriately, they become a great client again. You know, so they don't have to go away. Um, yeah. But what that does is that gives you the margin, the, the revenue, the margin to be able to afford the next person that you need. Um, but what happens is you get so busy burning all these hours in the clients that you're not profitable with that you don't have time to deliver great service to your other right. clients. And you end up with the one you're spending too much time with mad at you because you take too much of their time. And the ones you're not spending enough time with you mad at you because you're not giving them enough time. And guess which ones leave? The good ones, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, Yeah. If you can bring those rules back up real quick, Chris, because you know, I would, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have a burn to memory. Um, and, and you know, let, let's dive into some of these because relentlessly monitor and manage customer health. This could be a lot like that virtual CIO, VCIO we hear so much about and, you know, doing your checkups monthly or quarterly with your customers. Um, this law is probably the most challenging to get right. Like, when, you know, when it comes to my experience um, in a SaaS business with ConnectWise, the PSA, we were monitoring the usage, not the data, but the usage, because we knew a successful company is going to do company and contacts, tickets, invoicing, whatever, right? You can do the same thing in your MSB. If you're selling managed services to your customer, 
you've got them in uh, your cybersecurity offering, you can, or you're selling them Office 365, even an easier one, and I'm on with Pax8, so this is a perfect fit. Um, making sure they're using all the features there, right? If you're selling them, uh, geez, what is it called now? E5, they still have E5 licensing. This is how long it's been, yep. so, right? It, selling them E5, and it's more expensive, you should be monitoring and managing, are they truly using it? And having that conversation with them, right? It's a construction firm. It's a customer, right? You should be going out there. You know construction companies, we all know what they do. They work with subcontractors to build buildings. They have to share a lot of files with each other. They have to do a lot of scheduling. You should be educating them on using those features in office. So the product becomes more sticky. Your services become more sticky. Your retention is there. This is what customer success is about. That, that fourth law is very important and it becomes really hard for us to do it because can we do this with our tools? Office 365, certainly. Um, but if you've got them in your cybersecurity stack, is the vendor you're using, do they have a dashboard that exposes to you the usage your customer has inside of it, um, the backup and, and so on. And you should be looking at Right. What are what are key factors that you know are important for a customer in your MSV? Well, they should be calling support, right? If they're not calling support at all in a month, I'd be like, uh oh, does this mean they might be leaving? Right. You should monitor how fast they're paying invoices. If they're paying them right away, that's that's great. If you're seeing a lag start to happen and they're not calling your support desk anymore probably not going to be renewing with you, right? You, you got to look for things like this. Like what are key things in your services when you know someone's using them, they're going to keep coming back for more. That's what we're talking about there. That's why customer success is different than account management and support. I remember the book had so many metrics in it that you could, you know, could choose to use to monitor and manage the health of the relationship. And right. I'm an audio audible person. I don't like to sit down with a book. And I I found myself in that section of like, well, here's a metric that could tell you this. And here's a metric that can tell you that. And they're really going into detail on each one. And I remember like my brain would start thinking about how to apply that in an MSP. And then next thing I know, I'm having to rewind it because I didn't hear like the last 10 minutes of the whole audio book. Yeah. Right. I, I, do you have yeah. similar experiences or? Yeah, that happens to me. Even when I'm reading, I drift off. You know, I start thinking about cars and Elf on the Shelf, and then I gotta like stop. Where did I leave off? That's why I I am terrible at reading. Um, but um, you know, this this let me get. I want to get some like good concrete stuff for the audience. So think about this. I just talked about data. You should be looking at points, right? Um, here's an idea. Build your own algorithm. Um, you know, make it a simple spreadsheet. Say, okay, these are the services I offer. This is what I think they should be using. And then give them a score, right? Say, look, if, if a customer is running at a five, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're contacting support, they're paying their invoices on time, they're using Office 365, these features, whatever, scores a five. I know they're gonna renew. That means you don't have to like focus so hard on them. You know, your customer success team, they can be monitoring these reports in there, right? Then all of a sudden, oh, it's a two, not good. You might want to establish some workflows off that that get your team engaged. And and there's several different ways you can do this. And if you read the book, they talk about, you know, uh, <laughs> I always joke about this word cohort. I And I saw Mark Cuban took a big knock on it on LinkedIn the other day. He's like, I'm sick of these business words, especially cohort. It's grouping, okay? Can we just say grouping? You don't need to try and make yourself sound smart. Um, group your customers, right? Like, you know, you can, you can look at your customers and say, all right, we'll group them by how much MRR they pay us. So our top tier MRR, they're gonna get a lot more hands-on. Our lower tier is gonna get more of like a technology guiding them. And yeah, and your MSP, create some videos that when someone starts scoring lower, that you send them, that teaches them how to get more out of Office 365. Hey, did you, you know, you can contact our support when you have these kind of issues here. Like you have to, you have to like engage them to come back and you can leverage technology. It does not have to be phone call after phone call. 
um, use automated workflows. Uh, there's tools that are out there on the market. Um, there's one called Gainsight. That's a big one. Um, they, they can look at all of this data for you and start to build custom workflows that can automate customer success. And talking about that, I'm looking back to law number two, where you know, yeah. the natural tendency for customers and vendors is to drift apart. You know, none of this is set it and forget it. Like I, I realize, and I like your advice, you know, dial somebody in and maybe you don't have to put as much effort, but you never really walk away. And it is amazing. I think back in my own time and experience, how, you know, you, you do just kind of naturally, you get busy, they're good. We're not going to check. We're going to monitor as much. We're not going to make those touch points. And I think, you know, we're at a point, now, just just because you know somebody or you have a relationship, that isn't yeah. what makes the success. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, going back, hey, they they're not contacting support. Like a lot. Of, listen, I was a tech. I'm guilty of this. Great, <laughs> this customer has not contacted me at all this month. Love it. <laughs> you know, and then that starts to become common, and now you're drifting apart. Right. Or, uh, you know, I'll schedule that VCIO meeting. Uh, it got canceled, rescheduled, and then you forget to reschedule it. Or you're not having the right conversations and you're drifting apart. Right. You're, you're having the conversation of, hey, you're paying us this much and we've done all these tickets for you. and We've done this and this like uh, to help bring you closer together. You know, it's something that um, I've learned along the way. I took a lot of training at UC Berkeley on product management, and that's um, focusing on an outcome that the customer wants. You want to bring a customer closer to you. Stop talking about tech. Start talk, Stop talking features and functions and start talking about what that's going to do for their business. Let's get back to the construction company example, right? I'm, I'm a customer success officer or I'm a manager, and I'm talking to this construction firm saying, you're not using these features and functions. I feel if you did, you would be closing your jobs on time. You would be ahead of schedule. You'd have better engagement with your subcontractors. You'd be able to take on more work in the year by enabling this technology in your business so you can grow and compete. That's focusing on an outcome. Uh, that's a conversation everyone needs to have. Uh, and I'll tell you the top 5% are. If you're wondering, man, how do those businesses get where they're at? How are they, you know, how are they driving the value? And that's it. So what's, okay. So I, there's questions for both Rex and Craig. Craig, I'll start with you. What's the most out of the box, off the wall, thing you've done to either engage with a client or re-engage with a client? I, I got, you got to have something. I know you enough to know. There's got to be something you're willing to share. Yeah. Um, I'll just show up <laughs> at the I, house. I'll just I'll just show up at the house. Um, you know, Shane Swanson, Snap Tech. Uh, he's in Dahlonega, Georgia. Just showed up at his house. I knew where he lived. Uh, unannounced, knocked on the door. That won him over. Okay. Uh, I had another customer that I had met at an event, and he was in New York, and and we shared a common interest in music. And I was in Philly, and I thought, I'm gonna go see this guy. And there's a concert in New York tonight. Let's see. And I did. Um, you know, again, have the courage to be yourself. A lot of people say, ah, I don't want to, ah, I don't know. Like, I just went for it. Um, I think that, you know, that that's what you got to do. You, you want to do something that shows you can be vulnerable and that you're a person. Um, I tend, that's the things I stick to. I show people my genuine side. Um, if it scares them away, it's not my problem. I can't make anybody like me, you know? Uh, that just means it wasn't meant to be. You know, I, I'm going to st stick with the drop-in theme. Uh, we had a bakery in, next, like next door to our office, and we had we had some uh, uh, boxes that you put the, the bakery items in, the pastries and donuts and stuff. And we we had them printed with our logo on them, and we had an account there, and and uh, we like to just kind of drop in almost unannounced with a box of donuts or whatever, and. And just do a little walking around, talking to you know their their end users. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that went off great. But I I want to hit on something you mentioned about having those conversations about the business, right? 
and that that's hard because the um the a lot of times the clients think of you as the computer person that just they call when the computer's broken they don't think of you as their business consultant and the first few times that you try to engage in those conversations about their business goals and they're that's not they're not going to have that trust to talk to you about that stuff and it, yep. the first few times you have those conversations it'll feel pointless but if you stick with it and just look for those nuggets that where they do you know get a little bit vulnerable and share a piece of information with you you take that and turn it into something that helps their business um, you'll earn that trust um, you know relatively quickly and that's what opens the door to have those conversations so I just want to say don't give up when it when it feels pointless good thank you I, I appreciate both of you and your answers and your willingness to kind of respond to something thrown at you like that let's get back to the let's if you can pull the laws up um, yeah. this one I think I struggled with a little bit but number three you know uh, customers <laughs> expect you to make them wildly successful what's your experience with that how do you deal with that yeah, um, you know, people come to you and say, I have this problem. And you say, I have this solution. Yo, I'll solve it. And they think that um, they don't have to participate in that. Okay. Uh, I think most people feel that way. They're like, I'm buying a magic bullet right now, you know, um, and you're going to provide everything. And so it's, again, have the conversation, make sure expectations are set. Um, and customer success can really focus on this. And to everything we're saying here. Customer success can be that repetitive voice that doesn't give up, that keeps going, keeps building the trust. Um, yeah, they, but they do, they, they expect that you're going to solve all their problems. And, you know, I'll, I mean, people that know me, uh, know, yep. I manage the connect wise software. I used to have to challenge people to say the software doesn't do this and it's broken, doesn't fix. And I, instead of saying, Oh, show me, oh, there may be a bug or let, let me go see if there's some feature we can do. I would say, well, tell me how you do it today because there's probably a better way, right? You got to get to that point with your customers so you can help them be successful. You have to start challenging them a little bit, right? You're the expert with the technology and how it can grow their business. Um, sometimes you got to push back a little bit. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Rex, anything you want to add to that? No, I'm just looking at the clock thinking we got uh, seven more to get through here. <laughs> let's, do that. Let's, do let's, bring up the, let's bring up the next set and let's kind of go through this. So, yeah, you can no longer build loyalty through personal relationship. We kind of touched base on that a little bit where, you know, things have changed. Just because you know somebody doesn't mean that. So what have you found... Uh, Craig, to, to be the key factors in establishing that loyalty or gaining that? Yeah, I mean, the building the loyalty is delivering value on multiple facets, right? You know, they want to get to know you. Like, the reality is, is everybody tuned in here is working in small to medium business, and that whole thing's built on trust. Uh, so first, they want to build the trust, and then they want to see you deliver on what you said. That's simple. Uh, that's a golden rule that I have. When I say I'm gonna do something, I do it. Uh, and and the customer is gonna expect that. So they're gonna expect to have that relationship with you to get to know who you are, but then deliver on what you say that that's gonna be there. The relationship will get you there, um, but then the you know delivering the value, delivering the good the service to the expectation is what will get you the rest of the way for sure. A little bit of a spin on that too is is i remember um working with another friend of uh craig and mine jameson west right like i i joined him as he was transitioning from everybody wanted the the owner jameson to now there's a team of people that are here to support him and so going right. through that transition like the, to me when i read that it's, it it reminded me of this it's like we got a team of people to do this, or it used to be the one technician that would go on site, but we're trying to integrate the help desk with, with the person that they're most familiar with. with and and it, now you're getting more of a team supporting them. So the relationship changes a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, let's keep bring going those rules back that. up. Let's see, let's see, yeah. Um, yeah. Obsessively, you know, yeah. Product, product is your only scalable differentiator. Yeah, that's, sorry, Chris. 
No, I just because you're reading it off, I'd love to have you jump in and kind of explain that again. Some of these were like, oh, yeah, I think I know what that is. Some of them were like, what does that really mean? And this is probably one of those that you'd love to have your color on that. Yeah, that's a tough one to wrap your head around because, you know, people say, well, you know, I thought the differentiation comes from the experience and that's part of your product, you know. Um, you know, what kind of experience can you deliver to, that's scalable to all of your customers that makes you a differentiator? Because at the end of the day, in their minds, the technology may have become a commodity, right? It's you're protecting me with security, you're backing me up with whatever. And I mean, they don't know really what's going on on the back end. Um, how are you going to differentiate yourself? It's it's the experience you layer on top of those products that really make it that way. And um, in today's world, uh, you know, consumer technology has trained everyone that a great experience is what really what they're looking for, right? Look what Amazon has done. Uh, you know, how did they differentiate their experience? I can, <laughs> while we're on this call, I can order a whole, whole bedroom set, like with my hand off the screen and no one would even know. Like, that's a, that's a pretty cool experience. Well, I, I think too, think it, well, real quick, and Rex, I want to hear you say, but what I think about is that, Think of it in today's world where how many businesses don't have a tangible product? You know, think about, you know, companies that have no real inventory, no real asset, but they're substantial real businesses. So it's a very different concept of, of product, I think. Would, would you know, do you agree, disagree? I'm open to kind of hearing your take, but that's what came to my mind. Uh, yeah, I think I mean, a lot of people are struggling. Oh, go ahead, Rex. Go ahead. No, no, you go. You're the guest. Was, <laughs> sorry, the <laughs> delay's got me. Um, I, I, I think uh, where people are struggling is, you know, a lot of the technology they manage is gone, right? It's someone else's computer, the cloud, right? So it's, oh, shoot, how do I add value here? How do I differentiate? I you know, it was me walking into that server closet and pointing at all the lights and the big boxes and, you know, it, it, and all that's gone. Um, it's it's in a vendor's cloud somewhere. And I do think a lot of MSPs struggle with that. Like, how do I have the conversation now, right? I'm selling them something that they can't hold anymore. Yeah, this is the laptop. Um, but yeah, that, that this is one people have really got to start wrapping their arms around um quickly if they're not already is you know how again how are you going to take the product that you're delivering which is, could just be your service on top of that which it is um it's the experience rex you used to do a great presentation on this you would talk about symbols of quality all kinds of things yeah the symbol of quality thing I actually learned from the hotel industry which i'm in san diego in a hotel right now and, you know, they prepared my room for me when nobody, like I couldn't, I didn't get to watch them do the service for me, but they prepared it. And then when I walked in, it was, you know, how tight the bed was pulled. And, but you go in the restroom and there's a toilet paper and it's always folded over, right? Like, why do they fold yeah. that over? It's because they're communicating to you that they did in, in our terms, capacity management, right? <laughs> like they checked it to make sure there would be enough. Um, and I ask MSPs all the time, like, what's your symbols of quality? The more work you do behind the scenes, the more you have to leave some sort of a symbol that you did quality work for them behind the scenes. Otherwise, it's just I give you a lot of money. You know, the better job you do, it's just I give you a lot of money. I never see you. Yeah. I found this other guy that says he can do it cheaper, right? <laughs> you, you just reminded me of a funny skit. One of my favorite comedians is Sebastian Maniscalco, and he talks about being in hotels and like, I refuse to let them come in my room after I've checked it. And he's like, I even take a chair. I'll just go. I don't like where it is. I'll just go throw it in the elevator and send it down to the lot. <laughs> it is, oh, man. Good times. Oh, man. When I, I, I was thinking, too, that, that symbol of that, you know, um, how do we show that? What's, what is our product and how do we bring that? And I remember uh, – uh, partner talking about that one of his clients was joking and said, yeah, I haven't heard from you. I haven't heard in you from you in $27,000. So it's just that concept of their perception of their time was based on, oh, I haven't heard from you. Every time I hear from you, it's this amount of money. 
and how do we how do we change that perception i think does that tie in well to our you know attitude or how we approach customer service with our clients would you you think Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think they need to know that you're there, um, even though you're behind the scenes, right? And there's, again, there's a lot of ways, like Rex said, like, unfortunately, the days of leaving a mouse pad with your logo on there is, is pretty much out the door. People aren't really using those anymore, but <laughs> there's other things you can do. Um, Here's one you know, that a partner a gave me. Here's one <laughs> that a partner gave me. <laughs> Write it with me. That's great. Maybe those are making a comeback. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to, um, you know, but one thing I saw that I thought was fascinating, a company I met, geez, this is, I mean, we're going back 14 years. Um, I get a call to go do an on-site engagement with an MSP in Kansas City called the Purple Guys. And I'm like, Purple Guys? What's that about? When I got there, they said, you know, we always wore purple. And our customers just started saying, oh, Purple Guys here. And they rebranded to that and that became their symbol. It's like they delivered so much good quality while wearing purple that the customers then began to associate purple with quality, right? So, you know, fascinating thing. And, you know, I think, you know, even ConnectWise Blue, it was like, yes, you know, when you saw the blue, you kind of knew who you were dealing with. You know, Microsoft's got its color. Um, which I think is also blue, right? Um, <laughs> again, I get so sidetracked. Brings me back to a great quote from Fight Club. Cornflower blue, right? You got to have that. Uh, there's a power in that about color, Club. but um, it's, a, it's a good point. Yeah, we're not supposed to talk bring about it, it. Bringing it back. Let's bring up the list again. Let's go to the next yeah. one. Yeah, I'm let's, trying. Let's yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And I do want to talk about time to value. Uh, this is this is critical, right? It, especially you know that first six months, every all the impressions are being set of what it's going to be like forever. Um, you got to make sure you've got some good process that you're delivering value quickly, and it could be easy things. Um, and you can set up your PSA to remind you. You can do all kind of things like. On day seven, have the service manager call the customer. On day 30, get the customer success or the account manager back out there seeing how things are going. Um, but again, tie it to the outcomes, right? Even if it's a new client, it's it's a client you've had a while, um, you're delivering a new service to them. You got to make sure they're seeing the value in it real quick. So as a product person in your own MSP, you, you should understand what that is. Like, what's the value this thing delivers? Make notes of it. Just three easy things. Like, oh, this, this product allows me to chat with a customer. I can see who they are and they can submit tickets, right? And then focus on those things to, to ensure that those things are delivering the value they need, which is engagement in their company so the technology can help them grow and compete and hit whatever objectives and goals, you, you got to align that stuff quickly. It, that first six months is crucial. The book yeah, I remember doing it. these oh, customer, these um, client or customer onboarding meetings and you know, I'd be in front of their, their end users and I'd say, look, these next couple of months, you're going to get the worst service you're going to get from us because we don't know your systems yet. We're still make, bringing things to our standard. You know, we're just trying to figure everything out and you're trying to figure us out. Um, but in the meantime, um, I need you to be productive and not have your computers slowing you down. And I need you to submit everything that's that's a problem. And it's it's going to you know bombard us and it's going to be a big list and we're going to have to prioritize it and work through it. But I need the whole list. Um, but then we could look at like what is the most important list things on their list and we can deliver on those first. Right. So. That, that one really resonated with me. I love that setting that expectation up front and, and painting the, the, the picture, setting the stage. Um, can we bring up the, the last three uh, laws? Kind of like to go through and just try to touch base on these. Understanding customer metric. Craig, you talked about the, the outcome. Yeah. Is this kind of where that kind of fits in specifically? And we yeah. worked on it? Well, yeah, there's that, but... Um, the customer metric, right? Like understanding 
what features and functions of the service you're delivering are going to make them successful and then measuring that to make sure that it is right like again not you know measuring you know uh phishing attempts that failed or penetration testing or how many times they get locked out whatever it is you know um and and really just measuring it hard and, and understanding again what things are going to make them happy make them want to come back make them a raving fan that's what's important that that's why that customer success mindset's different because right you got to most people have a one year contract with their customer yeah some people have it set to auto renew unless you notify within 30 days you want to make sure you're not getting that 30 day notification you have to establish what the metric is. Again, you should know it. Um, like again, for me, when I was at ConnectWise, again, I knew that PSA. If they're creating tickets, if they're doing companies and contacts, if they're getting their time in, submitting their timesheet and doing invoicing and agreements, I know that sounds like a lot, um, but it's really not. <laughs> if they're doing all that, I know it's and know it's going well. If they're not, I need to start having the discussion with them because I understood MSP business. Um, for your customers, you, you got it. You're going to have to know a little bit about how their business operates and what's important to them and measure it, measure it, measure it. Um, something great I heard a long time ago when it was HDG, what gets measured gets managed and what doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Totally agree. You know, <laughs> can, Craig, can you talk just a second to like the accuracy of this data, if they're not operating at a higher maturity level, meaning they don't have um, real good consistency, quality of service in the way they, they operate their business, their data probably isn't very accurate, which means it's hard to do customer success from a data perspective. Can you talk about what you've seen in the industry? Yeah, people have to be disciplined. Um, and, and, you know, again, the, the number one problem that every MSP suffers from is time management. Um, you got you got to get your team's discipline and getting their time in, recording things, doing documentation. That's why great products exist out there, like Pia, Roost, IT Glue, and so on. These documentation automation platforms. It's to help. You you got to be disciplined in ensuring that people are following these processes. Because if the stuff's not getting recorded, um, you're you're never going to be able to pull this off. Um, and look, every vendor out there that you're dealing with um, or working with to deliver their solution, they've got some kind of dashboard. So it's just a matter of figuring out which piece is important to go in your customer success metrics and, and measuring it. But it's it just starts with the discipline. And, um, you know, it's I think, Rex, we used to call it managed by exception, right? Um, if these are the key things you know are important, look for when they're not happening then, instead of when they are happening. Um, and I can be a, a much better alert to you. You know, that might be an even actually now that I'm saying it out loud, a better way to get started is to manage by exception and then try and sub manage everything. Yeah, I've, you know, they've, I've heard that inspect what you expect, um, but I like to say it backwards. You can only expect the things you choose to inspect, which shouldn't be very many right. things, right? Yeah. can be other, well, yeah. overwhelming otherwise, right? Which is another issue. Being selective yeah. about what's important and measuring you know, what, what matters. The, the last one I want to hit, the last law I want to try to touch on quick is just that top-down company-wide commitment. You know, how do you maintain that as you scale and grow and make sure you get that commitment? Um, Craig, what kind of advice do you have for yeah. people to, to get the buy-in and make sure that that's happening for everybody? Yeah, I, I brought this up in the beginning when I, you know, I was saying, look, it, everyone's got a, a hand to play in uh, customer success from sales to procurement to service delivery, professional services, finance, ownership of the business um, has to be a part of the culture. It's that simple. Work it into your value statements if it's not already there. Uh, look, it's not everyone's job to be a customer success manager. But it's it's everyone's job to enable that function in some way, right? And work together. Uh, and I get it. You know, I hear I've heard all the fighting between finance and service delivery, and sales and sales and service delivery, and 
professional services with sales. Uh, <laughs> you see this in fighting. Um, you're just gonna have to, you gotta come together and, and, and get together. You know, it, it takes a strategy meeting and, and figure out like, okay, as a company wide, how are we gonna ensure that we're creating a great experience, delivering value, and then managing that value delivery with customer success. Every, everybody's got a part to play in it. Nice. Rick. So we, we need to bring 10 laws to a close here, but uh, any, anything yeah. we missed that you, you know, want to get out there? Um, look, I think that one thing I love to tell people is don't try and overwhelm yourself and do it all overnight. Uh, start small and just start, just start, uh, you know, go into your PSA, create a project, put a phase on there and figure out tasks, start making them tickets and start assigning them to yourself, put it on a schedule, get things done. But I, I think the best place to start is just group your customers, create, co <laughs> create cohorts, <laughs> create cohorts. Um, <laughs> figure out how you want to segment your customers to start uh, working with them to improve, you know, the relationship with customer success tactics, right? Like, Okay, how am I going to engage with them? Am I going to use technology? Is it going to be a one-to-one -one relationship with someone? Is it going to be very high touch? Am I going to go on site? Am I going to knock on their door in Dahlonega, Georgia? Or um, am I just going to send them a, an email randomly or a card? You, you, you got to start figuring out what are all the tactics you're going to do to engage with them and, you know, and what good looks like and then start you know, building out the journey from there, but you got to start. You just have to start. Yeah. Fail fast. I'll, I'll say my quick, quick takeaway from the book was using the data and how many different kinds of metrics feed, you know, you know these decisions of what to work on in the business. So yeah. Yeah. Chris, you well, got anything this, before we move over to a story? This is, this is great. I'm, I'm going to, we're going to take a hard left here and get into stories. And, and, and I think, Shows that we've got some car photos. I think that we we need to pivot to. We've got to talk with this. We've got a couple motorheads I, I here. This. I love this. Some gearheads. Craig, tell us about this yeah. picture. This looks great. Yeah, I got you, Rex. I got you. So, um, yeah, I'm a big car fanatic. I I restored this car. Um, a lot of welding. I painted it. Did the interior. Everything. Um, Rex and I kind of started around the same time. Uh, you know, restoring our cars. I'm a Chevy guy, Ford guy, and um, mine's done, Rex. So where are you at with things? Oh, I, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I sent a picture. I'm not sure if it made it in there. Oh, there's where mine is. <laughs> oh, I love it. I got a little ways to go. Um, yeah, it's up there so I can days. clean, like, so I can clean 55 years of road grime off the bottom of it, but. <laughs> It's getting there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love those days. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, I think you and I are pretty similar, right? You, you like to see things get done and accomplish things. I love working on cars because it's it satisfies that. Remember that there's two sides, right? I have the mechanic side and then the service side. I, I gotta, I gotta put my hands on something and, and get it done, right? I gotta work shape metal, and at the end of the day, check off I did something. Uh, you know, those of you tuned in that are leaders or managers, it's hard to get those check marks. Uh, sometimes people won't let you it get them is. when you're managing. Them, so. You know, one of yeah. the things that, you know, because I'm in the business of helping owners, like, understand their plateaus and what do they got to work on? What do they got to fix in order to grow their businesses? And, you know, they're all trying to figure it out as they go. And the car for me is I'm not an expert at that stuff. And I'm trying to figure it out as I go. And I'm leveraging YouTube. Like, Craig turned me on to... Oh, what was the guy's name about how to, how to do a cut and butt weld? It's yeah. yeah. Um, but his videos have been great to help me. Right. And I know our partners are yeah. using us to help them with their businesses. So there's a pretty tight correlation there um, that I've been yeah. enjoying. I do want to hit one more story. Um, I'm going to start it and I'm just going to toss it to you to finish it. But I'm going to go back to an IT nation, 2009 timeframe. You and I are presenting, I think it was on Streamline IT, right? And like we worked on a deck together pretty pretty hard. And I remember I'm standing uh, next to the screen. I've got the clicker in my hand and I push the button in front of a live audience and I'm gonna let you finish it. Yeah, and you hear, hi-ya! 
and I had a little ninja <laughs> fly across the screen that Rex uh, did not know was coming, and I, I stood behind the screen laughing. Uh, and I get the full get the duck, animation. right? <laughs> I had the, speak, the speaker right over my head, this thing flying across the screen at my peripheral vision, and I cowered yeah. and ducked. And then I looked like, See, what the heck's this, going on? And he's behind the screen. Yeah, this, this comes to my second favorite quote, which is, no one remembers normal, right? Everyone remembers that because it was not normal. <laughs> it was fantastic. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was going to find a way to ask that at the end and sneak this in. So very glad you brought that up. Craig, thank you so much for being on the show. This is I really appreciate you bringing value to our listeners and, and those, you know, uh, watching and and. You know, it really enjoyed knowing you over all the years. So thank you for being here. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Rex. It was great. And I'm um, honored to be here with you guys. Yeah, Let's move into you. final thoughts. So final thoughts. So Rex, there's a lot. Craig, I, I love talking with Craig and having time with him to me is always is, is always something amazing to me. Um, his experience, knowledge, has been around the industry a long time, um, his personality. For me, the, the two things I'll take away, I think, is one is I'm not going to say the word cohort for a very long time without, without questioning myself or, or thinking about what I'm saying. Um, but I think the second thing is, is outcomes. Um, I think that's a big challenge. I think customer service and really reevaluating and those watching – to really take seriously reevaluating the relationships, how they're managing, maintaining, preventing churn, keeping loyalty, investing trust uh, is huge. And I think the outcomes and how we think about things is a big challenge for, for our partners to, to address. But very glad he brought that up and said it. Rex? Yeah, if you haven't read the, the customer success book, please do. There's, there is so much detail in there that just makes you think, about diff, you know, this whole different way of understanding your customer throughout the, their entire life cycle with you, what those indicators are that are in your system that if you were watching them and looking at them, you would know that there's trouble to go um, work on and fix or that there's trouble with your offering that you need to work on and fix. And, uh, you know, the more you do that, the happier your clients are going to be, the less churn you're going to have and the faster you're going to grow. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah. Be sure to check us out next week. Our guest will be Brad Gross, and we'll be talking taxes. Remember, we're live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. and on demand always. Don't forget to subscribe and, subscribe and like us on the YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>